We are thrilled to welcome Paul Peter Tonk, President and CEO of Candel Therapeutics to the show today. Thank you once again for joining us. It's great to be here, Drew. Thanks for the invitation. Super, super excited to dive in, Paul Peter. Uh, let's kick things off. Could you share a brief personal intro with us? Yeah, absolutely. I would probably pr primarily describe myself as a physician. I've uh, treated patients for many, many years. Uh, at some point, I started to get more interested in also the development of the best therapies of tomorrow. So I became increasingly a scientist. So I'm a physician scientist. Uh, I led a large uh, department of um, clinical immunology and rheumatology at the Academic Medical Center of the University of Amsterdam for 12 years, uh, where we did everything from discovery to late stage development. We created our, our own biotech company. And after 12 years, I thought, well, maybe I could actually have a bigger impact even if I would join the industry, right? Because imagine that you can make a medicine that will uh, have an impact on patients with rheumatoid arthritis or with solid tumors, etc. So to make a long story short, I decided to ultimately join uh, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, where initially I became the senior vice president and the head of immunoinflammation. At the time, GSK was organized as uh, integrated therapy uh, area units. So there was everything from idea to discovery to early development, late stage development, approval, and beyond. So for me, with my specific background, this was very exciting. Uh, during those days, we brought quite a lot of medicines into the clinic uh, and also to approval. And then I started to ask questions about oncology. So I'm a medical specialist in internal medicine and rheumatology, but I've also always treated patients with cancer and other uh, uh, internal medicine diseases. So as a, let's say, specialist in immunoinflammation, I thought, well, how could you change the tumor microenvironment, for example, to convert non-responders to immune checkpoint inhibitors into responders? And at the time, that was not necessarily on strategy at GSK Oncology. And we decided to create a cluster of therapy area units, uh, which I subsequently led, which included immunoinflammation. So I found myself a successor who now reported to me but also the therapy area head of oncology. And uh, we also included infectious diseases because it's always about the balance between microorganisms and the immune system. Uh, and then I became the chief immunology officer of GSK and the global head of development and brought many medicines into the clinic and, and to approval. It's a wonderful introduction, Paul Peter. And before we dive in, could you just share a brief introduction to Candel for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, I got increasingly uh, interested in biotech. So after GSK, uh, I became a venture partner at Flexi Pioneering, led one of their uh, companies called Kintai Therapeutics, which merged with um, Senda uh, Biosciences. Uh, while in academia, I started the biotech, but also at GSK, I led the biotech company and subsequently also started the biotech company, which is called Citrix Therapeutics. So increasingly, I got interested in looking at drug development and drug discovery from a very entrepreneurial perspective. And at some point, I was contacted by a search company about a very unusual opportunity uh, that I had never heard of before, which was then called Advantage in Doing Business as Candel Therapeutics. Uh, I would say, since I joined three years ago, this is now a very new company. I call it the new Candel. This is now the formal uh, name as well. And Candel Therapeutics is focused on the development of viral immunotherapies for very difficult to treat solid tumors. And excited to, to dive into Candel and in the, in the future Genesis as well. But uh, I mean, just just love your, your further explanation and the background through Kintai, through Siltrix, and honestly, just really excited to interrogate a bit of your perspective, Paul Peter, as an academic, as someone who spent a large time in biopharma, as well as a serial entrepreneur. And um, I think many of these intersections, it, it leads up to a really productive conversation. We've had many conversations in immunology, but uh, as someone who has tied a lot of these groups together, I think we could uh, really interrogate some amazing questions around the future of the space. But um, really, be before we dive in, as we're talking about Candel, the Genesis story, um, I, I want to get a little bit of that 
idea from your perspective, um, just before you join some of the genesis ideas behind Candel itself, the underlying technology, um, just to take a step back, uh, could you tell us maybe potentially about the genesis of Candel? You know, what was really the spark that started it all in this in this viral immunology wave? Yeah, so let's say the new Candel Therapeutics is basically an integration of different components, building blocks that we brought together. So one was the program from Adventa Gene that has been around for, for several years. And uh, that's what we now currently call CAN2409. It's basically a replication defective adenovirus uh, encoding the HSV thymidine kinase uh, gene. Uh, and that's combined with a product that was actually developed by GSK, uh, which is called Valacyclovir. And we can speak about the mechanism in, in more detail, but we, we found actually that uh, this leads to in situ vaccination against the patient's own tumor uh, at the site of the injection, but also, as we've shown last year, uh, against uninjected distant metastases. That's called an abscopal effect, but basically it's evidence of a systemic anti-tumor response. So basically we vac vaccinate the patient against the patient's own tumor. You vaccinate against the whole variety of cancer antigens and new antigens that are released in the tumor microenvironment after injection of CAN249. So we are testing this now in multiple clinical trials. Actually, we are already in phase three in early localized non-metastatic prostate cancer. There have huge unmet need. Studies going to read out end of next year already. So we're very excited, fully involved. We're testing it in pancreatic cancer, also very difficult to treat uh, disease, as you know. And we will have initial overall survival data in Q4 of this year. And then we're testing it in patients who have an inadequate response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in non small cell lung cancer. So all of these areas, uh, we have proof of mechanism, not only in mice, but actually in humans. And um, we looked uh, when we prioritize the programs through different lenses. So first, is there a reason to believe what is the medical unmet need? What is the commercial opportunity? Is it developable? What is the regulatory pathway, et cetera? And so for each of these, there's a very big uh, opportunity from uh, a commercial perspective and incredible unmet need for patients. That's the, the, the first uh, and most important point. So that's kind of 249. We've shown that this is indeed a form of in situ vaccination. You don't need to inject all the tumors. You don't need to do it very often. Typically, two or three injections in a patient's life to get a, a very long uh, lasting anti-tumor response. And the goal is to improve overall survival. So that's the first component, the legacy program from Advantage. They we've, we've, we've learned a lot in the last few years about the mechanism of action and the best patient populations. And then the second is a program that we currently call CAN3110. That's a program that we in license from the Brigham and Women's, uh, Women's Hospital. This was developed by Professor Nino Kiyoka. Uh, the head of neurosurgery at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's one of the world leaders in research on high-grade glioma, brain cancer. Most of these patients will have glioblastoma. Um, and we have a fantastic collaboration with, uh, with this group. So CAN3110 is now a key component of our portfolio. And then the third is we created a completely new discovery platform. Um, I would say inspired by my time at Flagship Pioneering, uh, combined with very deep understanding of drug discovery and development. How, how do you do that in biotech and big pharma? And we call this the Enlighten Discovery Platform, um, inspired by the word Candel, right? It's about light. We are able to light up the tumors. And we can discuss later what the pillars are of this platform. So that's now together the discovery and development organization. Uh, then I brought in a completely new executive team with decades of experience in drug discovery, development, immunology, oncology. We know what it takes to, to get the medicine over the finish line. So a top team, we created a very high profile research advisory board, RAB, with people like Jim Ellison, the, the Nobel Prize laureate and other world leaders in immuno-oncology. So they're very close to our programs. And they participate in our internal governance process and our internal decision-making process. So we may come back to that as well. We have um, brought in some very high-profile new people into the board. Uh, only in the last 12 months, four new board members, including 
people like Joe Papa, who was the CEO of Bausch and Lomb, uh, Gary Nabel, uh, who is a professor of oncology and a fellow of the uh, academy, but also the previous CSO of Sanofi, uh, Rene Gaeta, who is a, a finance leader in the medtech world. Very recently, uh, Nicoletta Lorgia, who was overseeing manufacturing of cell and gene therapy at Novartis. She's now chief technology officer, officer of a biotech company herself. So we brought in fantastic new people, had a rigorous prioritization of the portfolio, deeply invested in what I call deep mechanistic studies, so that you learn as much as possible from your uh, clinical trials. I took the company public, so we did an IPO just in time. In 2021, things were already getting difficult. And that's why we did a straight to market IPO. We skipped the crossover, uh, which gave us enough funding actually to get to a very important catalyst. And you can speak about these catalysts in, in more detail. But it also explains the small market cap uh, of Candel Therapeutics because we don't have this uh, strong foundation of, um, of a crossover round. But it was the right thing to do at that time to get the complete company public to get to secure the funding to get to these data points that you will see in the in the very near future. So uh, these are some of the things that created together uh, the new Condell Therapeutics. And uh, we are very excited at this moment, very energized because there's an enormous stream of data at this moment. There's an enorm enormous stream. And I think uh, as you talked about the intersection of what Candel has put together, I, I think it's a really exciting moment just to take a pause here and just discuss from your perspective, Paul Peter, um, just the simpler idea um, around the idea of the genesis of Candel as we're talking about the creation story. Um, maybe could we just discuss some of the unique challenges that immunotherapies just face in discovery and development today? Uh, I, I'd love to just start there from your perspective and say, you know, what are some of those core principles that Candel is attacking or approaching right now? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm an immunologist. So for me, an immunotherapeutic in intervention in any disease, whether it's autoimmune disease, which was a, also a very important part of my career, and now oncology, uh, it, it has always been the dream that we need to get to. And, you know, this dream is, has come true. If you think about immune checkpoint inhibitors, and the father of this field is Jim Ellison, who, who sits on our board and who, who received the Nobel Prize uh, for his work, uh, which was groundbreaking. Uh, through this work, it has become clear that you can actually cure patients with an immunological intervention. So that's a paradigm shift. At the same time, most patients do not respond. So, that, so you have this proof of mechanism. And for some patients, this is, of course, the difference between life and death. But ultimately, our goal should be to uh, cure all the patients, if possible. Right? So the question will now be, how do we convert non-responders to immune checkpoint inhibitors into responders? Uh, when you think about CAR T cells, another amazing development, and one of the fathers of this field is clearly Carl June. And we were proud to announce when we announced the discovery partnership, uh, then we announced the um, discovery platform in Leuten. We, uh, at the same time, announced a discovery partnership with UPenn, with Carl Jung's group, and, uh, and Neil Shepard. And they have had, of course, an incredible impact on liquid tumors in hematology. But now the question is, how can you actually get a similar impact on solid tumors? So when you think, for example, about pancreatic cancer, the question is, if you develop CAR T-cell therapy, how do you make sure that you can get these T-cells um, into the solid tumor, in fact, the cancer, which is a highly immunosuppressive environment? How do you make sure that if they get in, there's actually mechanical barriers even, right, due to the role of stromal cells, how do you make sure that these CAR T-cells stay happy and functional and continue to eliminate the tumor cells? And one of the possibilities for both of these unmet needs could be the development of viral immunotherapies. Because when we go back to immunotherapies, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor treatments, we have shown that we are able to convert a cold tumor into a hot tumor with CAN2409. We are able to upregulate up up uh, PD-1, PDL one c 2 4 So there is reason to believe that you could create synergy. Similarly for CAR T cells, you could conceive that you would develop based on, for example, the enlightened discovery platform, that's exactly what we are doing, a new viral immunotherapy that will 
help the CAR T cells to get into the solid tumor and then stay functional by delivering multiple genes to the tumor microenvironment that will change the, the tumor. Um, so these are some thoughts in the in the field of oncology. And I love the organization of how you are describing the development of Candel, the actual separation itself from the discovery platform. I, I think it, it leads into my next question just, just pretty naturally as well. Uh, I, I think very similarly to as you're looking at Candel and the development, the organizational structure as someone that spent so much time in GSK, forming other companies as well, along with flagship, um, the development, uh, taking the company IPO and building out the Enlightened platform certainly took a lot of pieces together, especially in immunology as modality. There, there's a lot to come into it. Um, and, and so I, I think with the understanding of some of those current challenges in viral and immunology, building out some of these systems, uh, I think you discussed some of the different sides of the different platforms of Enlighten and the, the indications itself. Um, but could you potentially just tell us more about Candel's solution, how it addresses some of these challenges? And just you as a CEO, you know, how did you really arrive at the Candel solution and organize uh, the, the actual system itself to make this process fluid, <laughs> if that makes sense? Yeah. So the approach that, that we pursue is basically the following. We develop off-the-shelf products um, so that's important. Off the shelf means it, it's a medicine that you can just buy it in the pharmacy if approved and reimbursed, right? And that you can get to these patients without further modification, unlike, for example, CAR T cells uh, or a cell and gene therapy approach. So uh, that makes it very easy and straightforward. So it's off the shelf. At the same time, these viral immunotherapies are used to induce an individualized anti tumor immune response. So that's where they are comparable to, let's say, CAR T cells. So I think uh, the approach that we've chosen is unique in the in, in terms of the combination of an off-the-shelf approach, which is at the same time inducing a highly a personalized anti-tumor response. And this principle should work in principle in potentially any solid tumor. Of course, we can't um, do everything at the same time. But we are currently pursuing this CAN 249 uh, investigational medicine in, as I mentioned, early localized prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and non-small cell lung cancer. If it works in very early prostate cancer, where actually no medicine has been approved in the last 15 or 20 years, everybody else is focused on more late stage disease, then we could actually expand into later stages disease as well. We could start with oligometastatic uh, prostate cancer. Um, but we could also expand into completely different indications. In fact, we have proof of mechanism in humans in other indications. For example, in pediatric glioblastoma, we have published these data and we could show actually that you can inject this into the brain of children. And we saw some very um, uh, interesting clinical responses. Uh, we've tested it in another disease in children, uh, retinoblastoma, so a tumor of the eye, complicated by tumor seeds in the vitreous compartment. Uh, we, we don't pursue these in the cases because of the um, commercial lens that we applied and uh, we can't do everything. So you need to stay focused. We have a laser focus on delivering on the, on the current projects. But this, this works in, in um, several solid tumors. CAN3110 is a very different approach. Uh, it's a true oncolytic virus, unlike CAN249. It's an HSV, herpes simplex virus. Uh, and it's important to mention that everybody else has deleted a specific gene called the ICP-34.5 gene. Uh, and this gene plays an important role in replication and actually in the aggressive action of the virus against uh, human cells. So why did everybody else knock it out? Because it's associated with neurotoxicity. So if you think of an approved HSV in the Western world, uh, then uh, we can talk about TVEC or Imlogic. It's commercialized by Amgen. It has efficacy, otherwise it would not be approved. It's not, I would say, a huge commercial success. And I think this is in part explained by the fact that you need to repeat injection several times. You need to inject many tumors, which makes it just very difficult. And they miss the endpoint of overall survival at launch. And I believe that the molecular explanation is that if you knock out this ICP 34.5 gene, then it leads indeed to safety but you also sacrifice some of the efficacy. So what we've done, in particular what Nino Kiyoka's group has done, 
uh, they've reinserted one copy of this gene that put it under the control of a tumor-specific promoter, which is really smart. And this is the Nestin promoter. So Nestin plays a role in embryogenesis. It's basically absent from the healthy adult brain, uh, but it's upregulated on deep differentiated cancer cells like high-grade glioma uh, cells in the, in the brain. And we've tested this concept in humans, and we could show that it works, actually. We did not observe those limiting toxicity. We can maybe speak about the very exciting scientific data. We expect a very high-profile um, uh, scientific publication in the near future. I cannot disclose which journal, but there are not many journals that are more important than this one. And people will see what we've achieved in the last three years. It's just amazing. At the same time, strategically from a business perspective, it's important to mention that we detected nestin overexpression in a variety of other tumors outside the brain. So here again, we could expand into other indications at the right time. And you can think of indications like um, sarcoma, triple negative breast cancer, gastrointestinal tumors, thyroid cancer, melanoma. All of these tumors are characterized by overexpression of nestin. So we would predict that you would get, again, uh, specific replication in the tumor while the healthy tissue is, is spared. So you could create a very strategic portfolio there uh, across different indications. And then for Enlighten, we are able by design in a relatively short period of time to create new assets that we can develop to address a specific problem. For example, the problem of UPEN, how do you get CAR T cells into a specific solid tumors? But this could also be a specific problem of a pharmaceutical company, like how do you get NK cells in, the, in tumors? So that's also where we are open for business uh, to create partnerships where we can create molecules actually to create synergy with other approaches as well. So the, this partner mission model was actually something I, I really wanted to ask you around, Paul Peter, in specific. Uh, and I'm glad you led the conversation this way because we're as we're moving just a sidestep away to talk about the business side of Candela itself. Um, in your own background with GSK, leading other companies through acquisition, I mean, just bring Candela to IPO. Um, I, I think you have a really interesting perspective in what's happening in immunology right now. Um, and, and so I just love to provide a little context to our audience. If, if you could share a bit more about the challenges the field of biopharma faces right now as we're really attempting this transition in immunology from kind of one size fits all approaches to really this burgeoning field of precision medicine. And I think um, the partnership models that Candel is bringing in involved um, along with the, the new systems and modalities and in phase three right now that you all are adding, um, certainly kind of have this addition. But uh, from your perspective, that has been an executive, that has been a founder, an academic, and a pioneer in immunology, I'd love to get your perspective just even on this commercial change uh, in what you're seeing from Candel in particular. Yeah, so <clears throat> first, there are many challenges. And you need to increase your own probability of success uh, of your own organization, whether in academia or in pharma. You need always to work with the best collaborators. In, a, in an almost fluid, organic way, right? And I don't care where uh, the science comes from or where molecules come from, as long as we get to the best results uh, and create value for everybody involved. And that's how I worked in academia. Um, so we, have, we were very collaborative as an academic center, but we also worked very, not only with other academic centers, but also with uh, biotech and pharma. Uh, and then at some point I started to reverse that <laughs> being a GSK and created a highly innovative model to get access to the brightest minds in academia. So I did exactly the opposite there. And meanwhile, I was still uh, working as a professor of medicine uh, at uh, the University of Amsterdam. So for me, it was very natural to do that. So maybe I can speak a little bit about the immunology network that I created and the, the founder of this. And the be I mean, it's not a very inspiring term, immunology network, but I didn't have a better term for it at the time. But it will, I will try to bring it to life by speaking about the pillars that we created. And the first pillar was to create the so-called um, external immunology board. These were super smart professors of immunology uh, who were also collaborative, right? So you always need to manage uh, potential ego problems. You want to have people who really want to drive the science based on curiosity and doing the right thing. Uh, and they all have a slightly different background, also by design, like specialist in autoimmunity, uh, specialist in immuno-oncology, specialist in vaccines. And 
etc. etc. So we brought these people together. So they, they became like a think tank, the external immunology board. And the second pillar was what I called the immunology catalyst. They were also um, associate professors, full professors, a little bit younger in their career typically, uh, who we selected after a very rigorous process uh, from worldwide to get the best people in. And these people, we offered a kind of extended sabbatical. So they came in for a year into the facilities of GSK in Stevenage, which is in the U United Kingdom, one of our two major hubs. Um, well, I say uh, our, because it was then <laughs> GSK. And um, what I offered them was the following. They got world-class lab facilities. I gave them supportive, uh, supporting personnel, technicians, PhD students, uh, postdocs, whatever they needed. We org helped them organize the lab. But maybe most importantly, I gave them freedom. They didn't need to work on our programs at all. I uh, would rather uh, uh, say not. I, I wanted to give them complete freedom. And it went quite far, actually, because they would also have to write on their IP if they discovered something in our labs, as long as it was not related to DSK molecules. Then we would own it, obviously. And my idea was that the whole scientific commu community of DSK would get access to these super smart people. And we would get more peer review, more discussion, more challenge, more innovation. They would help us to see the opportunities in the future that would be beyond our own strategy. And then the third pillar was actually kind of little almost venture fund that I created internally so that I didn't need to go through all the uh, internal process if, if it would go to an inflection point, which would cost us, let's say, uh, $200,000. Uh, to do a rat experiment or a mouse experiment. And so I could go very swiftly. Um, so that was the third. And then the fourth was we organized um, symposiums that were like um, the keystone meetings, right? With these people from the external immunology board, the, immun the immunology catalyst, uh, our own scientists. Actually, I discovered when I joined TSK that just amazing scientists in the industry, right? That was for me an eye opener at the time. Now I know that very high quality as well. But creating this, this community with different backgrounds has helped us enormously. And by doing so, we created, we started to see opportunities that we had not seen before. For example, in the field of immunometabolics. Uh, and it led ultimately to the creation of a company, which is Citrix Therapeutics, uh, and it's based in, in, in Oxford. So one of the, so this is one of the solutions to advance the field. Uh, if you think about another aspect that you touched upon is what is one of the challenges in uh, the field of immunology. I will start by speaking about autoimmune disease. Uh, I prefer to use the term immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Uh, you can abbreviate, <laughs> abbreviate it as IMIDS, immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. On one spectrum, you have the true autoimmune diseases. On the other spectrum, side of the spectrum, you have the inflammatory diseases. And if you think about the condition, let's say, like rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus, SLE, as examples, but I think it's true for almost every disease on this spectrum, actually, these are not real diseases. They are syndromes that consist of completely different molecular subsets. And one of the big problems is that you need to reclassify based on molecular classification. So we need to start to rethink how we, how we classify the disease. So in RA, rheumatoid arthritis, we know that if you give, for example, uh, TNF blockers, which has been a breakthrough, and actually we were intimately involved in the, in the development as an academic uh, in my early days, um, then some patients will respond, other patients will not respond. It's very comparable to what I described for immune checkpoint inhibitors in cancer. Uh, but you can also give a completely different mechanism, like rituximab, wipes out the B cells, or you can interfere with a co stimulatory pathways and give abatacept uh, interfering with antigen presenting cells and T cells. When you look at the overall response rates, it's almost always the same slide. With the same percentage that will have a 20% improvement or a 50% improvement or a 70% uh, improvement. And I often at lectures show that slide and I would ask the audience, which medicine is this? And people would say, well, it's TNF blockers. And then somebody else would say, no, it's abatacept. And somebody else would say, it's tocilizumab, whatever. And I would say, all these answers are correct. The point is only that 
the patients who respond, respond to a TNF blocker are not necessarily the same individuals who will respond to reduction. So we need to understand how do we get to 100%. And one is to, to really develop precision medicine approaches and to really reclassify, not based on clinical signs and symptoms, but based on molecular mechanisms. It's easier said than, than done, actually. We've done a lot of work in that field. We can do that on the population level, but precision medicine in autoimmune disease has not been easy, I have to say. Uh, but that is one of the challenges that we will need to overcome. And then, of course, there's this whole world of people that say, well, but we don't know this disease, right? Because that's not how we classify and how do the regulators think about it and the payers. And so this means that the paradigm shift is needed. Actually, I, I wrote an article a few years ago in Nature Immunology about it, so people can read it. Uh, together with some key uh, immunologists in the field. I think this is where we need to move towards to, but it's a new paradigm. In oncology, I think we are a little bit more advanced and it's more, I think in a way more straightforward to develop yeah, precision medicine approaches. And um, I think we also see more examples where this has been implemented successfully already, but still a long way to go. So these are some of the things that I'm thinking about. How do we optimize collaboration between academia and industry? How do we start to think about reclassification of disease in a more sophisticated way, ultimately leading to precision medicine? So you get the best benefit risk for patients, you get the best cost effectiveness on the societal level, and you don't expose patients to medicines that are never going to work uh, for them, and that actually may lead to toxicity. And, and this is certainly a, a topic that we we spend a lot of our thought leadership around as well, Paul Peter. And I, I think it's a, a amazing intersection to something we released recently was around a target to market, the simple idea, right, of uh, getting from that academic cycle, moving into biopharma partnerships. And someone who has uh, spent a lot of time on this, as we're staying high level, um, I, I just want to take a quick pause to discuss from your own perspective um, through Siltrix, um, through Tempero, and, and the other acquisitions and groups that you've led as as a company, as a founder, also being internal to GSK, um, as you're seeing this paradigm shift, I would just be really curious from your perspective, do you have um, advice, tips, insights into how you led your company um, around this intersection of academia translating to partnerships? Maybe if we could just start with biopharma partnerships. So as a spin out, um, as you are reaching uh, the clinic, you're reaching series, you know, kind of higher up in Bs and you're saying, you know, I want to intersect and start working with biopharma. Um, do you have advice for burgeoning founders, other people to, as they're starting companies, uh, advice to actually start those partnerships, start those relationships correctly and, and uh, begin that from the start? Yeah. So, so first uh, I will repeat what I said before, you need to create a network with uh, the the best collaborators and advisors, and also manage the fact that everybody, even when you're a real expert in the field, you will always have blind spots. And the same is true for me, actually. So how did I optimize decision-making? Because actually it, it comes down to decision-making. Uh, at GSK, for example, I spoke about the external immunology board, the first pillar of my immunology network. And if I would consider a partnership with another pharma company, or I was looking at a biotech company, that we might be interested in, in partnering or acquiring. Uh, I would do my own research with my, my team. But the, during the, uh, the, this process, I would always pick up the phone and ask at least one, two or three of my external immunology board members how they looked at it. And then they would say, well, we just reviewed the whole pile of grants for the NIH in this specific field. And they would, they would have very clear ideas. And, and then I could reflect on their feedback and, and, and think, well, maybe I need to change my mind or not actually based on what I heard, but you get better decision making. Uh, I do the same actually at uh, Condell, that we created the research advisory board that I spoke about, the RAB, so now I would look at it from the uh, biotech perspective. And I created a, a simple process, but you need to have some form of governance to get to the best decision. So after the teams have done their uh, their work and their research. They work with our external consultants, etc. The collaborators. Then, at some point, it comes to the what I call science and investment board, SIB. The name already reflects that we will look at it through multiple lenses: scientifically, medical, but also we look at the investment and commercial opportunity. And then, at least one or two of the RAB members will sit in that meeting. That one and a half hour later, we make a decision about the trial. This is what we're going to do, or we're not going to do it. So it's it's in a fluid way you want to optimize the interaction between people 
in academia and biotech and or pharma. So how do you, do I think about uh, partnerships from a, let's say, Convell Therapeutics perspective? So we are a company that has programs in phase two and phase three, while well, we also do discovery. And if pharma companies are really good at one thing, it's actually late stage development and commercialization. And my goal in life as a physician, because that's a central theme, I've had different roles, but actually I'm always doing the same. I have a laser focus on developing better treatments for patients. And by doing so, I try to create value for everybody involved, uh, including the shareholders, obviously. So uh, what we, um, of course, would explore is potential partnerships for the late stage programs at the right time. And now that we can say, well, next year we have a readout of you know, a phase three clinical trial where there's actually no competition because it will be first line treatment in the so-called active surveillance population. So these patients have low to intermediate risk prostate cancer, and they elect not to start with the currently available treatments like uh, radical prostatectomy surgery or radiotherapy plus or minus hormonal therapy, androgen deprivation therapy. So these patients, are kind of trying to avoid the currently available treatments because of all the side effects. Uh, but actually, they have still a, a cancer, right? And a slowly growing tumor is still a growing tumor. And most of these patients over time will end up with these radical therapies that I just mentioned, will face the side effects and complications. And then one third of these patients will still have progression after the disease. So still, this problem has not been solved. So if you develop something that works, that's great. But um, if you really want to bring it to as many patients as possible in the world, that would be my dream, then probably the best way to do that is through a partnership. For example, a regional partnership or co-development worldwide. And the same would be true, for example, for the other program that we have in prostate cancer, which is a more aggressive disease, that we use this as a neoadjuvant combined with optimal standard of care. Because if you have high-grade prostate cancer, uh, high-risk prostate cancer, you will need to give, for example, radiotherapy, plus or minus hormonal therapy. But actually, prostate cancer is the second uh, most common cancer in men in the US and in many other parts of the world. And it's still, in spite of all the new treatments for late stage disease, is still the second most common cause of death, of mortality due to cancer in men. So this problem has not been solved, actually. So we try to increase the percentage of patients that will be cured by combining it with optimal um, standard of care. So that's clearly uh, an area where there could be uh, an interesting opportunity to partner with the pharmaceutical company. Um, so that's how we look at it. And um, I think this is probably the right time to do that. On the other side of the spectrum, I spoke about the enlightened discovery platform. This is actually where in a relatively, relatively short period of time, we can make new molecules to solve the problem of a pharma company that says, well, we want to um, increase the percentage of patients that will respond to my immune checkpoint inhibitor. Or I want to make sure that we get the NK cells actually to the side of the tumor. And we believe that you actually don't need to, to um, inject all the tumors because actually the metastases talk to each other through micro vesicles and other ways. And also the larger tumors have more tumor micro environments. So maybe you, you just inject the larger tumor. So, this is an area that uh, needs to be uh, investigated in more detail, but there's some preliminary and exciting data. So that's also where we would be open to business actually um, for partnerships. So that's how we think about it from a biotech perspective uh, and from a strategic perspective. I, it's a wonderful overview, Paul Peter, and I appreciate you diving into the intricacies on the partnership level, especially through the lens of the Lighten platform towards the end there. Um, I, I think it's amazing what Candel has been able to develop from a back-end perspective, and it's exciting to see the new indications that you all are stepping into as well. Uh, and as we're just taking a pause here, um, as we're coming up on time and looking at this, uh, I, I really just want to discuss a, a quick moment of just major challenges, accomplishments um, from your own perspective, uh, just just leading Candel through this uh, two sides of, you know, two investigational bioimmunotherapies through the clinic and just so many more to come as we talked about with the platform. Um, taking a step back, Paul Peter, you know, what have been some of the greatest challenges you've just faced uh, at Candel building and scaling it post IPO? Yeah, maybe I should, before I get there, I first mentioned why I joined this company. 
so I, I mentioned I was contacted by by a search company. I'd never heard of these programs actually. And I called my former head of uh, the therapy at a unit of oncology at GSK. <laughs> Do you know these programs? I said, no, I've never heard of it. So they were very much uh, under the radar actually. And, um, but I looked at it, I did my own due diligence. I spoke to some key experts. So I always use the same methodology to come to the two decisions. I, I, I spoke to world leaders in high grade glioma, prostate cancer, I showed them the slide deck. And, and I came to the conclusion that there's really the potential that these are transformative medicines. And that's ultimately what really matters. Then there were many gaps that needed to be filled in from a scientific uh, perspective. The company on every level needed to get ready for the next stage. And I thought with my mixed background as a physician and a scientist, as a biotech entrepreneur, as a pharma leader, as a venture partner, maybe I can have a real impact here and can really help drive massive change. And that's what we've done in the last year. We went through a massive change project. So that's a challenge in itself because that's difficult and also painful because people, of course, are used to a certain way of, of working and of doing. And uh, so change is always difficult. Um, so we have a brand new, as a result, executive team, 100% um, new team, super experienced. We, we did uh, uh, bring in new board members. Uh, IPO was difficult because people did not know the company. And um, they thought, and, and now you are claiming that this is a biotech company that focused on immunotherapy and cancer, you're in phase three. So it made people feel a little bit suspicious. There were gaps in our understanding of how it actually works. This whole concept of in situ vaccination had not been proven in humans as yet. I can tell you three years later, we can uh, compete with the best academic labs and people will see it that the whole stream of accepted abstracts at scientific meetings that will be presented in the next few months uh, we expect a very high impact uh, paper. So we filled in these gaps actually also uh, in part externally funded, which was quite helpful, like the biomarker research that's done in non-small cell lung cancer, where we've learned an awful lot about the mechanism and also the effects on uninjected lesions, which is very important also from a medical and commercial perspective. Uh, it's actually largely paid for by PACT, partnership uh, with academia um, uh, to advance cancer therapies. Uh, the CAN3110 program, so the HSV that replicates specifically in the tumor that's being tested in recurrent high-grade glioma. So these patients have a very poor prognosis. They failed neurosurgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. is now uh, almost completely funded by uh, the Breakthrough Cancer Foundation, BTC. So this is all fantastic external validation but also it gives us access to non-dilutive funding. You don't see it in our numbers because the money goes straight to the PI, uh, Nino Kyoka, uh, and we run it like an investigator-sponsored study. Uh, but it's a molecule that we develop, right? So, uh, but um, the, the challenge has, of course, been to do this massive change at the time of a global economic crisis for all kinds of reasons that I do not control, uh, in part related still to the COVID-19 pandemic high inflation levels, supply issues, then the fact that there was a really a bubble in the, in the whole biotech world, so biotech is hit harder. And we will see, and we have started to see a real carnage in the biotech markets. And actually, I think it's painful, but it needs to happen uh, because there is just not enough money to fund everything. And I think this may bring people back to the principle that ultimately, they should be about medicines that will really change the life of patients. That's also where ultimately the, the money is generated, right? In the marketplace, by, by medicines that are reimbursed and that are paid for. Uh, so there needs to be real data and there needs to be real impact on patients' lives. Uh, so I, I would predict that companies that have proof of mechanism in patients, which by definition have a higher probability of success to get it, uh, to, to this place will be more successful. But of course, this has been difficult to do an IPO around this time. We were just in time and we have been successful. Uh, but the mar we, we don't get credit at this moment when you look at our market cap. That's the last piece that we systematically want to change at the right time, in the right way. I can't speak about it. I'm the CEO of a public company. Uh, but of course, we have a very clear plan. And that we've been super systematic. First the team, right? Prioritization. Other difficult decisions that we needed to make 
I only want to develop transformative medicines. And not everything will always be completely transformative or it may be redundant. So we were ready to start a phase three clinical trial with CAN2490, the in situ vaccination approach. Uh, in high grade glioma, we got also support from not only the US, but also the European regulators, fast track designation, all of that. After a single administration of CAN2490 to the resection bed, the wound bed, uh, after resection of the tumor in the brain, that there was local immune activation, systemic immune activation. But you know what? I was not convinced that this was transformational. And then we have CAN3110 as well in the same indication. And I decided to stop the program. So that's painful, right? There was difficult, difficult conversations for the external collaborators. Everybody was very excited, right? It, it seemed to work, but I believe CAN3110 will work better. And we need to be absolutely clear about using the resources in the best way possible to really extract the value. Challenges and how I think about trying to deal with it. And you, you you certainly covered so much ground, Paul Peter. I I wish we had more time to to dive into some of these amazing challenges that you've had leading Candel in the change. I'm, I'm glad you actually even touched on the IPO market as well, and the the transitions and uh you know top down capital funding has been really really fascinating, and um the timing I, I felt like of your IPO was really interesting. So I'm I'm glad you you touched on the ideals there. Uh, I I wanted to quickly take a moment before we continue on as well. Uh, I I think all of the challenges you mentioned are, are fast how you all have have transitioned through but just to flip the coin here you know on the same note you know what have been just some of the greatest uh accomplishments milestones you've reached and we've discussed some of the clinical yeah. advancements and stuff early on but i'd love to just give you all the moment to discuss just the amazing progress you and candela have had yeah that's a great question because i can tell you when i walk into the office i just feel the energy in the company because we are so excited about what we achieved and it's on multiple levels so what do you have actually as a biotech company? You have the best science, or we, you should always focus on the best science. And then that's one. And second, you need to have the best people and make sure that they work together as high performing teams and that you have a very strong culture uh, with great values and behaviors uh, where people can bring the best of themselves and be really creative and uh, have a laser focus on quality and delivery I think we got there actually. So, and the third pillar is, of course, you need to be able to fund it, right? So, we have been quite creative. Um, I think after the IPO, we've not attempted to go back to the markets. Uh, as yet, we find we've been quite successful in getting access to non dilutive funding. We work in a very cost effective way. So, we are our own CRO. So, that's also where we've been quite innovative. We don't spend any money on a CRO. I don't want to be negative about CROs, but as we have so many development programs, this is the, the most cost effective way of doing it. We have our own CRAs, Clinical Research Associates. So, we do all of that. And we are now starting to harvest, right? And we expect data in non small cell lung cancer, new data in Q3 of this year. So, I don't know the data yet. We just had the data cut off, but we hope that we are starting now to, to get a signal that could it be possible that we can start to predict who are the patients with which profile, clinical and biomarker profile, that are more likely to respond to CAN249 treatment during continued immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment, while they actually failed in the past the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Is, are there certain clinical features uh, is it the site of injection? Does it matter whether you inject a primary tumor in the lung or a tumor in a lymph node, a metastasis, or a peripheral uh, tumor in the liver? Does that matter? Um, and can we actually start to enrich for clinical response by doing so? We are also starting to explore now that we know already that there is an effect. Uh, we started to ask the question, here we gave two administrations of CAN249 to vaccinate a patient against a patient's own tumor. Think about COVID-19. Could there be a benefit of a booster? So we have now submitted an amendment that we started to explore this. Is there a benefit of a third injection? It would inform the, the, the future registration or clinical trial. Uh, we're also asking the question now, are we starting to see patients who live longer than you would expect? How many patients are still alive after 12 months? How many patients are uh, alive after even 18 months, right? We expect median overall survival in this population of not more than 10 to 13 months. So we learn a lot. And then again, deep biomarker data. 
pancreatic cancer, we have a group of patients that has been treated in a randomized clinical trial. They have borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. Everybody gets optimal standard of care. They get chemotherapy, chemo radiation. Uh, then the surgeon will try to remove the tumor. That, that's not always possible. That's why it's called borderline resectable. And the patient will randomize to receive either optimal standard of care, plus CAN 24 9, two to three administrations, or optimal standard of care alone. We have a group of patients in total 13, 1, 3, 6 control, 7 CAN 24 9, where we have now a follow up period of almost four years. So that's quite long. You know that these patients don't live that long, uh, right? Unfortunately, it's a big unmet need. So in Q4 of this year, we are going to look at uh, the question, is there a separation of the, of the lines for overall survival between CAN 24 9 versus control? And this is not in a traditional, well, traditional way powered, obviously, for a p-value. But I'm a big fan in experimental medicine, as I call, call it, to use what I call the BOT which is the bloody obvious test, right? And this is a concept that has been published in the past, actually, right? If you see that these lines are identical or almost identical, you don't have a medicine, you should stop it and don't spend the waste money on it. If you see a clear separation, that's not a placebo effect. That's not regression to the mean. And that's also not expectation bias. That's real. It's like jumping out of a plane with or without a parachute. You don't need a randomized clinical trial for that. So. I don't know what it looks like, but we will have pancreatic cancer, overall survival data based on a randomized trial, uh, small numbers, but we are looking for big effects, Q4 of this year. Then we will have top line overall survival data in lung cancer in Q2 of next year. We will have the readout of two randomized clinical trials in early localized prostate cancer in Q4 of next year. We expect to make continued progress with the enlightened discovery platform. We know already that there's an accepted abstract based on a new asset that we will present at the scientific meeting in the very near future. And we know that we will have a very high profile publication around CAM 3110 in the near future. So there's an enormous uh, number of uh, inflection points or catalysts, if you wish, uh, that will hopefully create quite a lot of value. And it will give us confidence that we are developing viral immunotherapies that will change the life of patients and that will drive enormous value. I really appreciate you also discussing the the approach, the the major accomplishments in the past, but also the future projections and the amazing progress Kendall hopes to make in the, in the near future. Um, I, I want to actually continue projecting out in the future. Um, as we're wrapping up the the episode, I, I just want to ask a few questions around how you're thinking about the future of Candel and, and some of the ideas on the business side. And so if I could start there, um, you know, with any platform company, Paul Peter, I mean, there's almost always a debate between vertical integration and horizontal platform expansion. As we've talked about the partnership model and the platform that Candel is developing, um, really, how are you as a CEO thinking about these opportunities going forward? Yeah, maybe there's a third way, actually, right? And I think I, I touched upon it. So what is the future of Candela going to look like? So as a CEO, I will always say I like optionality, right? If somebody knocks on the door tomorrow, I said, I want to, to buy the company for 20 billion US dollars, well, <laughs> then we, that we will not be able to resist that. But ideally, we will build a real company out of this, right? Through partnerships. We are really good at discovery. We are really good at translational medicine. We have very good relationships with the regulators. We understand what's needed. We focus on quality. But I do know that pharmaceutical companies are have, to, have the capabilities and the size and the resources to really bring this to as many patients uh, as possible who may benefit from this and, and extract really the value. So we would be open at the right time to, to partnerships. Ideally, I would say, not by selling the medicine, because then actually you, you sell the company without selling it. Uh, but a great way to grow Candel would be uh, through partnerships, where you work together for CAN 249. I would be open for business. Uh, now, obviously, there is uh, we have conversations uh, with pharma companies to keep them up to date. Uh, CAN 3110 would be the same. We have not highlighted CAN 3110 actually uh, until maybe very recently because we have so much to talk about. But now that we know that uh, this is well tolerated, we presented data in 50 patients, 5-0, with recurrent high-grade glioma. This is not a, a small clinical trial anymore. We see almost doubling 
of the expected median overall survival after just a single injection. We see completely transformative case reports. Patients who had progression within weeks after the second neurosurgical procedure, we gave this patient one injection, a single injection with CAN3110, and the tumor disappeared. And this patient lived for another two years until she died in a car accident. I mean, so we know that there is something, right? And now the question is, how can we enrich for that response? Can we understand it better? So, so that's again where we may be open for partnerships uh, because we could now, this is an enabling clinical trial also for other tumors outside the brain, as, as I discussed uh, earlier, in light of the same. So ideally we would, by being super collaborative, as I've always been in academia and also at GSK, but now from, from the Condell Therapeutics perspective, we may be able to leverage uh, the brains and the resources of other parties to, to grow this company in a very thoughtful and strategic way. And Paul Peter, I, I have to point out on, on, on the side, most of the, these discussions have returned back to talent and sourcing the right folks, the right individuals to be at that intersection, to help Candel, help your own uh, organizations that you've led in the past as well. And so um, I want to take a moment to discuss the future of talent. And just from your own perspective, some of the mental models that potentially you've carried in as a leader, some thoughts or, or you know, mentorships ideas that you've kind of had in yeah. general. But um, to really begin with this, because you've had such this intersection at GSK, mentoring folks in academia, but also bringing in collaborations in this intersection as well, which is Candel, um, just given academic research has this dual purpose of advancing our scientific understanding and just providing a training ground for the next generation of scientists, you know, how do you, Paul Peter, uh, as CEO, but also just how does Candel think about connecting with academia for translation of the future of immunology? Yeah. So here again, we work in a fluid, organic way where it makes sense. We have long-standing collabora collaborations. I think an example would actually be around CAN3110, which uh, Candel in license from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. The, the inventor uh, is Nino Kioka, the head of neurosurgery. We have a fantastic collaboration. He secured uh, funding uh, through the Breakthrough Cancer uh, Foundation. We've now started to actually evaluate the effects of multiple injections. So um, the first patients have, have been dosed, so that could be very exciting. And we have this very strong scientific collaboration with, with this group, right? So we published together. And actually now in the last year, two of his scientists joined Candel Therapeutics. Actually, uh, one just joined uh, one or two weeks ago, and the other one during the last year. So we also start to, to get a kind of exchange of, of personnel almost, because people see that we do great science, and they can uh, and and we have a laser focus to get this to patients and to create value. Um, so how how do we how are we attractive as a company for talent? And the same principles are true in in big pharma and academia. So there are certain principles that, that worked for me, at least, that I actually summarized one day on a Sunday afternoon on a little article that you can find on LinkedIn. So if you go to my LinkedIn site, Paul Peter Talk LinkedIn, you will find it and go to articles, you will find a little article that says how to build a biotech company or any innovative organization. And um, I, I basically created a little building, little temple with 10 pillars. It could have been nine or 11, but 10 appeared to be a better number. And I described some of the principles, but I will, I will say the following. I always look for people who are really good at what, uh, what they are doing, right? Like super scientists, or super developers, et cetera. Second, there's always a very strong focus on the behaviors and the cultural values of people. And are they motivated by your mission, you need to have a clear mission. Actually, that's nice in biotech because our mission is to treat and cure cancer ultimately, right? First, we want to improve their survival. So that will resonate with many people. Then you need to make sure that these people can actually do their work by optimizing decision-making and not a very complicated governance process. Uh, you need to make sure that you push down decisions to the lowest appropriate level which will often not be the level of the CEO, but sometimes it is the level of the CEO. So that's why I call it the lowest appropriate level. And first you get better decision-making, but second, it's very motivating for people that their voice is heard and they can have a real impact and you get the best out of them actually. 
Uh, culture is important so that people really feel that they can bring their whole self to the company, that we embrace diversity on every level, uh, including cognitive diversity, and uh, we have a very diverse uh, organization. Uh, so all of these um, aspects help to attract and retain talent. Maybe one additional thought is, I, I call our culture a culture that's defined by the combination of freedom and accountability. They go hand in hand. So I give people a lot of freedom. For example, our vacation policy is that there's no maximum of, num of the number of days that people can take off. They need to talk to their manager and explain why it's reasonable. Maybe the Maybe it's possible from a work perspective. Maybe they feel that they need to be for three weeks in Botswana and we will work it out. Right? So that's, a, that's freedom, but, that's, but it cannot exist without accountability in running a business. And um, so there's, there's also a very, very strong focus on performance management. One of the predictors of retaining talent is making it clear that you don't accept low performance uh, in a company by other people very interesting right and that has been described in the book uh i think it's power of, or powerful um and um that so all these aspects are very important i think we, we have had relatively low turnover i work with people who worked with me in the past at flagship pioneering uh, i work with people who worked with me uh, in the past um, at uh, gsk i work with people in my company who worked with me in academia so I think that is a, probably a sign of high levels of trust. So when you think about my little building or little temple, the roof is called is actually collective intelligence, where you leverage the diverse talent that you bring in, where you create a process where people can have debate. And you can't have a high-performing team without some form of conflict, actually. And then at some point, you make a decision, and then everybody needs to get behind it, right? It's a team. Then it's a team decision. It's like top sports basically, but the foundation of this building is trust. So you need to be thoughtful about how do you create trust? For example, by always doing uh, what you say that you do. It's also important for shareholders actually, right? Uh, we, I, I tend to under promise and over deliver, right? So I, I promise quite a lot in terms of inflection points. We're going to do this actually, all of that. We've done everything that we've said that we would do since I joined this company. So trust is important, but also in the one-on-one -on -one interactions. Of course, you need to have high levels of integrity. It's a very important factor of trust, et cetera. So that also helps to work with the same and the best people over time. Could, could not agree more, Paul Peter. I really appreciate your insights on, on talent as someone that has accrued it and put your own thought leadership out in the ecosystem. And we'll have to link as well um, some of your thought leadership to the space. I really wish we had more time to dive in and discuss more on these sides, and especially through company creation, translation, and just your own insights as well. So again, we're really appreciative of your time. But um, just a few rapid fire questions just to close things off uh, as we're coming to an end here. Um, as, as we're looking at the, the space overall in immunity, technology, um, you know, what would you consider to be the greatest challenges in advancing precision medicine and immunology in the coming decades? So, in, uh, I will start again with the field of autoimmunity, because that challenge may in a way be more difficult, bigger over there. Uh, so, I, I come back to the concept of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. We need to drive a paradigm shift in our thinking and come up with more rational classification criteria uh, to classify disease. And I think I can say that. I'm a, a co-author uh, on the classification criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. Very nice because it's super highly cited, of course. <laughs> Everybody who writes a paper about RA has to cite that paper. But you know what? It is mainly based on clinical signs and symptoms. And again, I, I would be the first to say the next step needs to be something more sophisticated. We need to get a deeper understanding of why is it that some RA patients are fantastic responders to TNF blockers? Why is it that some patients with psoriasis are great responders? Why is it that some patients with inflammatory bowel disease are great responders and others not? Should we say, well, there are patients with TNF dysfunction and the manifestations may be in the joint or the gut or the skin? We, can, we, we could start to think about this in a different way, but you can see that it needs to be more sophisticated. This is just an example to introduce it. But of course, it has enormous implications for how the whole scientific community thinks about it, regular, regulators, payers, uh, healthcare professionals, patients, patient organizations. So we need a, a paradigm shift. Second, 
I think it will be important to move from treatment of late stage disease to earlier disease, earlier and earlier. Uh, and that means that we need to, need to rethink the whole paradigm, also from a commercial perspective. And ultimately, we need to aim for cure and even better prevention of the disease in people who are at risk of developing a certain disease. So in my life as a professor of rheumatology, we did a lot of work in this field. And I, we were even able to identify people, I don't call them patients, who at a high risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis, which is an awful disease, Within a period of two years, we had a 40% chance of developing RA based on the autoantibody profile and other factors. And then we did a randomized clinical trial in these so-called healthy people with an abnormal autoantibody profile, where we gave them either rituximab, one infusion, or placebo. And we could show that after a single infusion of rituximab, we could delay the onset of rheumatoid arthritis by one year. Well, that's a cost-effective intervention, but that's a whole new concept right when i started doing that people said well that's unethical it's unheard of and then later everybody embraced it they thought it was great so but, but this is where we need to how we need to think about it uh, cancer is exactly the same right precision medicine but this has been introduced when you think about driver mutations etc uh, but there's still a long way to go we need to move to earlier stages of the disease we need to try to cure patients and the commercial models need to be developed to make that attractive so that we can continue to invest in innovation that people are rewarded for the investments and for the risks that they've taken. Ultimately, on the societal level, we will need to, to, to try to prevent disease, right? Both autoimmune diseases uh, and, and cancer. So these are some of the thoughts that I have. I think in terms of established disease, what we will see is a multi-modular approach. So think again about autoimmune disease. I think every modality could be in scope, ranging from small molecules to cell and gene therapy approaches, viral immunotherapies, uh, biologicals, but also completely different approaches like bioelectronics. Uh, that's a whole field that could be a whole podcast in itself, right? But I had a relatively small research project when I was a professor of rheumatology in Amsterdam that we were actually trying to uh, identify new targets for my gene therapy company <laughs> focused on rheumatology called Astrogen. And we worked together with a company called Galapagos that many people may know. And we created um, uh, an SHRNA library and we looked at synovial fibroblasts from the joint, et cetera. To make a long story short, without looking for this, we found actually that the so-called cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway played a very important role and that the vagus nerve can actually control inflammation. And then we were the first actually to test this concept in rheumatoid arthritis because we went straight from in vitro to mice, to rats, to humans. I went to the neurosurgeon in Amsterdam and said, there's this device that has been approved, which is a vagus nerve stimulator. Are you able to implant that? And they did. We, we did the trial that has been published in the PNAS. And we could show that in therapy-resistant rheumatoid arthritis, if you give like 60 seconds of stimulation, electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve, that you can have an impact on TNF production and on activity in the joint. Amazing, right? And uh, this is going to be a big field. In preclinical models of acute inflammation, the pioneer here has been Kevin Tracy in, in New York. But we focused on chronic disease and we took it into the clinic. Um, so, that, so there are completely different modalities that we may think of, including, uh, of course, um, a focus on the role of the gut microbiome, uh, uh, and uh, lifestyle measures, food, all, all these factors together. We have a, we need a really holistic approach to improve disease outcomes over time. Hey, it's certainly some uh, amazing predictions on, on the future of the space as well. It's great to hear from your perspective, Paul Peter. And uh, one question we like to ask in a, in a rapid fire sense, maybe to put a line in the sand to discuss some of these future predictions, um, just the future of medicine. Uh, we we really like to, to hone in on one year. And so we really like to say, you know, imagine uh, biotechnology in 2050, right? Um, we look at the future of immunology and medications. Where do you think we will be in that side? What have we cured? What new medicines have we developed? Where will we be going from that? Well, first, I think we live in an amazing and unprecedented time where science is just growing in an exponential way. Our understanding is growing so rapidly that it must lead to a completely different uh, uh, 
view on, on disease, right? So I'm quite optimistic that the two different big areas that I focused on, autoimmunity or immune-mediated inflammatory diseases on the one hand, and cancer on the other, will see enormous progress based on the principles that, that I described. I think we will move to earlier interventions, earlier disease, better outcomes, first better overall survival, because that's what matters to patients with the right quality of life, then uh, hopefully cure, and then prevention of the disease using a multi-modular approach, which is informed by deep understanding of the specific individual patient. It will be a, like an integrated predictive marker uh, based on genetic profile, but it's, there's more than genetics. I mean, genetic is very, very important. Uh, and we will see uh, enormous progress based on deep genetic um, sequencing, et cetera. But if you think about the autoimmunity, there are many autoimmune diseases that are not so clearly uh, influenced by genetic factors alone, right? There's a very strong interaction with lifestyle factors, uh, environmental factors, et cetera. So all of this needs to be taken into account, the role of the, the brain, uh, thinking about control, by, I spoke about the vagus nerve. So uh, I think we will see enormous progress. Uh, will we be able to cure all these, the, the diseases in 2050? That, that sounds like a dream. Uh, but we can't exclude the possibility that it will be fundamentally different and that also the commercial models and everything will follow. And the, the last question here, just falling in the same vein, still imagining it's 2050, where do you hope Candel to be? I hope that uh, in 2050, right, that's that's far away, but I hope that, I mean, that I could be happy with different outcomes, but a great outcome would be if we continue to drive enormous progress for patients with unmet needs through viral immunotherapies. It takes time, actually, before any new modality is mature. Right. So like a few years ago, people said, well, I've never seen that the viral immunotherapy works, actually, and therefore I don't believe in it. Uh, it's interesting, people, or, or not people, but society has a short memory. Uh, and when I was a PhD student at the Leiden University Medical Center, I was in an MD PhD program, I was involved in testing all the new antibodies in rheumatoid arthritis. And in an early stage of career, it appeared that I was making my career based on very well-conducted experimental medicine clinical trials that were all negative. And I remember presenting at the American College of Rheumatology uh, annual meeting, ACR, big meeting, that there was a session with four oral abstracts, and I gave two of the four, and both were based on completely negative trials. People asked me, Paul Peter, how did you manage that actually, right? They said, well, these are very well-conducted trials, but that there was no evidence initially that biologicals would work. Like uh, we tested anti-CD4 antibodies, first depleting anti-CD4 antibodies. Then everybody said, no, you need to test non-depleting non anti-CD4 antibodies. And we did, it was also negative. We gave interleukin 10 subcutaneously, I can go on. Until we tested the molecule that was uh, called CA2. I'll come back to that. But during that time, I remember talking to a very big key opinion leader in the field of rheumatology, who said, well, Peter, antibodies will never change the face of rheumatoid arthritis. That was the feeling in the, late, in, in the early 90s. And then we tested in collaboration with the Kennedy Institute in London, a molecule called CA2, which later became known as infliximab or Remicade. And it was a randomized trial, and we had never seen a miracle like that, right? Because people in the wheelchair could suddenly walk again. Not everybody, but we knew that there that, that was a signal. Nobody would say nowadays, I don't believe in antibodies. The question is, what kind of antibody? Against which target? Um, in which disease do you develop it? What's your vision for the medicine? Same true, was true for CAR T cells, for immune checkpoint inhibitors. So every modality takes time until people have figured out how to use it. So I think that's where we are with viral immunotherapies. We make enor enormous progress. We are seeing very interesting proof of mechanism in therapy resistant disease. If you see that the tumor like high grade glioma that, that is basically growing in spite of everything that's available and it's basically shrinking and it continue, continues to shrink over time. That's what we've seen actually it's, it's in our corporate slide deck, an example. Then you know that this this field is maturing. It's not only Candel. There are other companies that have been successful with different approaches, like Replimune. Uh, there are other examples of uh, vaccination approaches that that are 
starting to be uh, successful. And I think about Moderna is very interested in this field right now. So I think this whole field is changing. All of this comes down to the world of paradigms. It always takes time before you see a paradigm shift. And this is at the same time, one of the challenges that we did not discuss that when we present to people initially, right? You are talking to many people who are in a kind of echo chamber where they look at each other and say, well, we've never seen that immune checkpoint inhibitors work or, or CAR T cells or now more recently viral immunotherapies. I think it's going away actually at the moment, but it made it difficult three years ago presenting for the first time to investors in the IPO, for example. So everything fails in, for the new modality until people figure it out and it actually works. And then five years later, everybody says, yeah, of course, and they all invest in this field. And I think we are at the on the cusp of, of this tipping point in this field of viral immunotherapy. So I hope that Condell in 2050 will be a leader in this field and will be successful and will have helped to change the life of many patients and that we've created enormous value for our shareholders and for our employees. And we certainly hope so. And we're excited to follow along on the sidelines. And uh, Paul Peter, I, I wish we had time to discuss, you know, from your vision, the, the evolution of the field of immunology. And I, I love to hear from your perspective as well, um, even looking in the viral immunology space, the evolution you've seen leading Candel. Um, but really, just, just one final question here as we're closing things up, just any other closing thoughts you'd like to share with our audience or, or shameless plugs? You know, how can our audience learn more about your work along with your LinkedIn and the other thought leadership pub that you publish? Yeah, so um, fi final thought is that I'm super excited and energized and I've built great teams in my life and that's why I've been successful in very different areas and it's through other people who are, who are very smart and they should all be better than I am in their specific uh, fields. I think Condell Therapeutics is now probably one of the best teams I've ever built so that gives me a lot of energy I'm proud of that and grateful to these people who put in their time and energy and their brain and everything and we have fun together fun is also important um, so that's great. We start. This is a time where we may start to harvest actually, um, and, and see the effects of a very new approach, next generation viral immunotherapies as as we develop them. If people want to learn more about my work, um, they, they, there's there's quite a lot on on LinkedIn. There's also a website which is actually paulpetertag.com. Uh, just mention it as one uh, name. Paul Peter Tuck is one word, uh, and then .com. Uh, where you will see other podcasts and interviews that I've given and, and some other thoughts that I have. Well, Paul Peter, thank you once again for an absolutely fantastic episode. We're grateful for your time and just thank you once again for a great episode. It was great talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.